behalf of Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom and Care, we would like to welcome you to our web talk dedicated to the 10 most underreported humanitarian crises 2021, compiled by CARE uh, this year again. And uh, our volume today is uh, dedicated to Malawi, uh, which ranked number two on the list, uh, meaning that uh, Malawi got the second least media coverage globally uh, when it comes to, to crisis scenarios and, and countries affected by crises. So this is the reason why uh, Malawi entered uh, this ranking edited by CARE. Before we are stepping in our, our web talk, um, Obviously, we have to acknowledge that there is a war in Europe, um, a war unfolding in front of our eyes, uh, invasion in Ukraine, people in need, in dire need. And this is obviously a sad reminder of the global scope and scale of humanitarian crises and crises. And um, it is a sad reminder but at the same time, looking at the global uh, wave of uh, solidarity pouring towards Ukraine, trying to help and, and alleviate the suffering of those affected, it is testament to the power of media, media coverage. This is what generates uh, attention, funds, donation, people willing to help. And this is exactly the mechanism uh, CARE is using in the list to just generate uh, attention and hopefully funding uh, and donations and support for forgotten, forgotten crises. And uh, with this in mind, obviously, uh, our hearts are reaching out to Ukrainian people too, but now we're shifting to Malawi because Malawi is, is our topic for today. Uh, so we are moving 11,000 kilometers from where I am posted right now near Berlin towards uh, Malawi and uh, I'm uh, going to introduce to you our panel. But before I'm doing that, uh, we uh, have prepared uh, two charts to give us an idea of uh, uh, where, where, where is located um, Malawi, uh, a little bit um, inside of uh, what we are talking about, because maybe not all of you are, are familiar with the situation when it comes to Malawi. So as you can see, uh, we are talking about almost 20 million people. Um, Human Development Index 2019 ranked Malawi 174 out of 189, which is obviously an, an, an index uh, telling us that there is that there is a, a, a situation which needs our attention. Um, even if you continue um, looking at gender inequality, ranked 142 out of 162. So this is something which is which we are going to analyze in the course of our web talk. Um, we are shifting to uh, slide number two, please. And we just got uh, additional uh, numbers and facts, which we are going to address uh, during our talk. Malnourishment is a topic. Um, vulnerability of girls and women is another one. As you can see, 42% of girls are married before the age of 18. And uh, primary education, education in general, is another important topic we are going to address in the course of our talk. But to make a bad situation worse, uh, Malawi was hit by uh, tropical cyclone Anna, 26th of January this year, and uh, it caused tremendous devastation and uh, misplacement of people, people in dire need of food, of water, sanitation and shelter. So uh, this is obviously uh, the, the most urgent uh, humanitarian action point which, uh, which the government is dealing right now and which, which we are going to elaborate in the course of our um, panel discussion. And with this said, we have laid the groundwork to just welcome our panel. And we're going to start with Clement Stumboli. Where, where's Clement? Clement, can we see you? Just wait, here we go. Clement is, uh, we can see him. Clement is a former minister of Malawi government and a member of parliament. 
He is currently treasurer of Africa Liberal Network, which is comprising uh, about 40 uh, political parties across Africa. And uh, he has worked as journalist and publisher of a daily newspaper, The Monitor, in Malawi. We're very happy to have you with us. Welcome, Clement. You're with us. Perfect. Uh, next one is Maggie. Here we go. Maggie is Maggie Banda is founder and executive uh, director of the Women's Legal Resource Center in Malawi, short Warwick. So she is working uh, on, on assisting women to facilitate uh, greater access to social, economic and political power. Um, Maggie uh, holds a, 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 a Bachelor of Social Science. She has a postgraduate in NGO management and a master degree in development studies of Cavendish University, Zambia. We are very happy to have you with us, Maggie, bringing us the female perspective, especially when it comes to vulnerability of women and girls in Malawi. Welcome, Maggie. Thank you very much, Brita. Um, our third uh, uh, guest in the panel, I'm not sure if he has already joined us because I know that he had some problems. Uh, hopefully he will be with us later on. It is Amos Zaindi. Um, I cannot see him yet, so I'm just introducing him and hopefully he will hop, hop into our discussion later on. Uh, Amos is uh, a development, um, international development professional with over 20 years of working experience. Uh, in East and Southern Africa. Um, his focus topics are comprising agriculture and food security, education, health, gender and women, economic empowerment, and many more. He has been working for Self-Help Africa, Save the Children, and currently is working as country, di country director of care in Malawi. He will hopefully join us a little bit later on. Um, before uh, we actually start our discussion, we would like to invite you, the audience, to join us uh, with your questions, your comments, your thoughts. Uh, you can do it in four languages, actually. If you like, you can do it in German, you can do it in English, in French or Spanish. I will monitor your question and questions and we'll give them to our panelists, if you wish and like. Again, our panel is in the spirit of hope and optimism. We do not only want to paint a gloomy picture of Malawi, but uh, yeah, a, a positive narrative uh, for you to join us during the course of this discussion. And with this said, uh, Clement, I would like to start with you. Um, I wanted to start with Amos, but um, Clement, you, you please, can you give us an idea of how the situation is on the ground right now? We were talking uh, uh, tropical cyclone Anna, um, disaster relief management. How is the situation on the ground, Clement? Well, uh, as regards uh, the situation on the ground, um, the after effects of a tropical cyclone Anna are quite devastating. Firstly, we're talking of uh, loss of infrastructure. We're talking of roads, bridges, uh, power network, and uh, even power generation. Yeah. As a country, as we sit now, we are having challenges in the area of power generation countrywide because having uh, had a uh, problem with uh, the general facility, which is uh, in what we call it has affected the country in the sense that uh, we are having uh, a, a shortfall on our generation facility, yeah. and that's why. Uh, but uh, what is also more challenging is that uh, we are having about a million people who, are, who have been affected. We are having a lot of uh, uh, families that have had their houses destroyed because of the cyclone. And uh, that is interpreting into a shortage of food because uh, we are having about 120,000 uh, hectares that have been destroyed. We're talking of... Uh, uh, hectares of uh, crops. Yeah. So in the long run, 
what this shall mean is that uh, much as uh, meantime we're having about uh, 900,000 people, it may interpret into a shortage of food for about 5 million people out of the 20 million people that we're having. Yeah. Because uh, these are the people that produce food. And uh, after producing food, the food is um, sold to other people, especially those who are town dwellers. So the effects, the after effects of uh, Cyclone Anna yeah. uh, are quite intense. And uh, we are going to live with these problems uh, maybe for a year or two to come. Okay. And the, the other challenge, the biggest challenge is that uh, on the intervention, uh, as we're talking now, we are having a very big gap, which is so difficult to fill because uh, the required intervention, uh, immediate and required intervention is about 8 million, 8, 8 million or so. Mm -hmm. But uh, what is on the ground is, is uh, less than uh, half of that. Uh, the government and uh, the cooperating partners combined. So uh, this is a very big problem, but unfortunately uh, the coverage of uh, uh, the Cyclone Anna has been very poor. We haven't been covered as, it, as uh, we're supposed to have been covered. And uh, this has been also been intensified by the challenges in Europe between Russia and uh, Ukraine, the mm -hmm. attention of the world has shifted completely yeah. uh, out of Africa and uh, the concentration is now in uh, Europe looking at uh, what is happening in uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, so it is our hope that yeah. uh, probably uh, this may help in uh, 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 this may help in advising the world as to what challenges we are having. Yeah. Uh, but uh, to sum it up, we are in a big problems. Okay. And uh, even for the infrastructure to be replaced, it, it, it requires a lot of money. Yeah. And uh, even just the power generation, it requires something like um, 20 billion in Malawi purchase. So it's, uh, it's a mess. It's a yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Clement, for this uh, this this idea. I can I can see uh, Amos in in the office. Uh, welcome, Amos. We are we're happy to have you with us. I already introduced you, so uh, people know who you are. Uh, welcome, and uh, Amos. Yeah, as country director of of care, um, I mean. You, you, you already had a handful of work before uh, Anna, Anna hit your country. And I mean, what, what, what does it mean to just uh, be, yeah, you, you have to be everywhere to just help and assist, right? Very true. Hi, everyone. Uh, apologies for joining a bit late. Technology. Oh, no worries. Uh, it's, yeah, please. Yeah, exactly. That's what it means. It means being all over. It means being able to to reach out to communities that are in most need at a supersonic speed. At the same time, uh, we are talking of challenges of communication. Um, I, I believe my colleagues have alluded to uh, the fact that uh, the damage uh, caused by Cyclone Anna is quite extensive, more especially on key infrastructure, uh, roads, bridges, and, and, and other uh, uh, key infrastructure, you know, facilities. So that, in the end, made it difficult for us to be able to uh, to get to where we would want to get to and support the people in need. Yeah. But we're trying our level best with uh, concerted efforts uh, with um, government, uh, fellow NGOs, and other humanitarian actors. Uh, however, the efforts are not adequate. Um, are not adequate. The needs are enormous. And when you look at the immediate needs, uh, there is so much that needs to be provided. Um, let me also highlight here, and I'm happy that Mark is here. Uh, we are together in the field. Uh, some of the issues that, um, that everyone talks about when there is a, a situation like what we're talking about, we look at the physical needs, mm -hmm. right? That's what everyone will rush, go to shops, get vendors, supply blankets, food and stuff and all that. But this time around, I think, one issue that has been under highlighted quite high is the psychological needs that the affected populations uh, need. Issues of protection, issues of sense of belonging, issues of trauma, 
how do we ensure that we're able also to provide that kind of uh, need, which is not felt, you cannot see it uh, immediately. It's later on when it manifests, that's when you now look at someone and say, oh, this person is not right, but that's too late. So one of the issues that we're also struggling to build in is to look at how do we build in these uh, psychological needs in the humanitarian response that, that, that's within us at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, like what Clement has said, the key issue that we have is resourcing. <laughs> resourcing remains an issue. I, I can unpack the numbers. You know, we are looking at $88 million that's required. Mm -hmm. um, the UN and other international partners have pushed in a flash appeal for about $29 million. Uh, government has got less than $5 million. That's what they have uh, pledged. Yeah. So the deficit is huge. Even the flash appeal, it's not money that is within our hands. It's just an appeal. Uh, we are still waiting to see if there will be uh, a good response yeah. from the international community. But like I said last time on, the same, on this same platform, we, we, we are overshadowed uh, uh, by other, other, other emergencies that are considered you know, quite attractive for reporting and other issues. Cyclone Anna is coming at the, at, at the shadow of uh, Russia, Ukraine. Yeah. So already, all the stories you can see right now is about Russia, it's about Ukraine. Nothing mm -hmm. that you can hear on the international media about Malawi. I was trying to browse through yesterday and today just to see if anyone, any, any media outlet at the international level has picked our, our flash appeal for resources. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not there. Yeah. So th that's what it means. So how do we ensure that crises that are sitting in these geographies um, that may not be quite attractive when it comes to international profiling are equally given the space, are equally a, a, a profile at that level because people are suffering. Uh, because there are issues there. If you if we share with you the images that came out of Cyclone Anna, yeah. I'm telling you, one would begin to think and said, "Is this in Malawi, or uh, maybe if it was somewhere else, it should have gotten prominence in terms of profiling and report." Let me stop there for now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, um, yeah, Maggie, uh, talking about women, uh, equality, and uh, yeah, the 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 uh, power shift and everything when it comes to female and, and male interaction in Malawi. I mean, um, disasters is a way to highlight this this sort of imbalance, right? And the vulnerability of of women, particularly girls, isn't it? Yeah, thank you, Brita. Of course, um, that's that's very right. That uh, in human crisis, humanitarian crisis like this, mm -hmm. that's when you actually see the disadvantages that women and girls have. And I think for the cyclonana, as uh, Amos said, and even Clement said, that uh, this has been more de devastating as we compare to all it, all other crises that we have had. Yeah. So already you find that uh, right now people are in camps. So women have been displaced of their homes, from their homes, they're in the camps. And now in terms of the camps, we are talking about access to services. Some of them are not available. As I must say that uh, right now people are interested more in terms of giving food, in terms of giving immediate needs. Yeah. But then yeah. there are other needs that are not being looked at. So for example, issues of sexual and reproductive health services. You find that most of the women right now, those that are in need of that, are not able to get the same. Right now, we are also talking about issues of safety and security for the women and the girls in the camps. We are already in a situation where, as a country, we say that one in three women would experience gender-based violence. So already, in terms of uh, their vulnerability, is already increased staying in the camps, where issues of security is also not guaranteed. So you find that there are also uh, pockets um, uh, of, uh, of people complaining that uh, they are being subjected to issues of gender-based violence, even the fear or the threat of sexual violence itself within the camps. So as OREC, as the Women's Rights NGO, our focus has also been on how best can we provide services to the women so that at the end of the day, they feel safe enough within yeah. the camps where they are separated from their families. We were talking to a woman in Sanji in one of the districts where she was even complaining to say, my husband is somewhere else, I'm, I'm somewhere else. So already even that shift, even that displacement is bringing um, stress on the women themselves. So as an organization, what we have been doing is to provide what we are calling legal aid. So we have been conducting 
legal aid clinics. Mm -hmm. And as Amos said, that uh, one of the things that we noted is that the women are not just looking for legal um, assistance, but even psychological assistance. So what we have, what, what we have seen is that there's need for um, psychological support and uh, legal support as we go into the camps. But definitely the crisis has shown the disadvantages that women and girls already face even in their normal life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, we're talking, I mean, just even, even before a disaster scenario such as Anna and the cyclone and, and the devastating if, if effect this cyclone had, what was it before? I mean, uh, we're talking women, just, just talk about an, an, a normal life uh, for a Malawian uh, woman. I mean, yeah, I mean so uh, what, what is it like? I, Okay, so I can I can point out a number of things. So mm -hmm. a normal Malawian no man's life, and that we are talking about in the rural areas especially, because well, that's where the majority of the women are staying. If you check our population, you find that 75% of our population is in the rural area. So a rural woman's life would be characterized by a number of things. So one is the issue of poverty. So uh, poverty in Malawi is feminized where you find that it's more women than men that are experiencing poverty. Because most of the times they don't have access to finance, they don't have access to income, which they can then use to develop their lives. Issues of violence against women, you find mm -hmm. that it's more women than men that experience violence in their lives. And the statistics already show that one in every woman would have experienced gender-based violence in their life. Yeah. So you find that even access to GBV services is limited. So you get facilities that are just at the BOMA, at the, at the central government uh, uh, level. But you go into typical rural areas, you find that there are no GBV services available that women can tap from. You talk about issues of education, for example, you find that it's more uh, men than women that get educated. And there are various factors that also go with that. You talk about social norms, you talk about traditional uh, practices, you find that in most cases, it's women that are disadvantaged, where they have to undergo. So like in the case of Sanja and Chibawa, the districts that have been affected, you find that there are issues of sexual cleansing that women are forced to undergo. Yeah, in the belief that uh, when they undergo such kind of things, then the uh, village is going to be cleansed of a bad woman of death and things like that. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of... Uh, the things that already happen to women in their normal day-to-day -day life, which then get compounded when they face this kind of crisis. Yeah. You talk about yeah. their distances to social services. For me, I say that even though social services are applicable to both men and women, but they become a women's issue when they are not available in the community. So where women have to cover long distances to get to the nearest safe water points, where women have to cover long distances to get to the nearest hospital. All these issues coming to play in a woman's life in Malawi. Issues of energy, access to energy. These are issues where a woman will have to walk long distances fetching for firewood so that they, they can prepare meals for their families. So all these issues compounded, and then you, you find women themselves in camps where they cannot access the services which were already not being assigned. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so there's a whole scope of activities you you are you are offering in terms of empowering women, right? Um, your your picture is frozen. Uh, yeah, you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah, love, lovely. Later on in the course of our discussion, we are going to address this and, and see what Waldrick is doing in terms of education, financial literacy to just empower women. So a little bit, we, we're going into this a little bit later on. Thank you very much, Maggie. Uh, Clement, um, talking about a vision for your country. I mean, uh, Malawi is a predominantly agricultural um country. Um, so I, I figure ir irrigation, uh, supply of crops and everything is an education is it would be a, a tremendous help to to bring forward your country, right? Clement, we can't, we cannot hear you, please. Can you give us your voice? Yeah. As you have rightly put it, Malawi is predominantly an agricultural based economy. And uh, the biggest challenge in uh, its operations is that uh, we depend on rain-fed agriculture. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, rain fed agriculture is quite a big problem because you could have rains, they start, and if you have a dry spell, it affects the crop. And uh, also the other issue, uh, unlike along the equator, in our case, we have got one rainy season. So we only uh, plant once a year, which is a challenge in that people cannot, most of the people cannot have food, enough food all year round. Mm -hmm. So for, if uh, Malawi is to change, the government and uh, other partners have to look at uh, transforming agriculture, especially when it comes to irrigation so that at least we should be having two crops in a year. Mm -hmm. Malawi is a blessed. It has got uh, a lot of uh, water um, in form of rivers and uh, the lake itself, which is called Lake Malawi. And also it is endowed by uh, a lot of groundwater, which can be drilled, pumped out and uh, have at least some sort of irrigation. But all these things require heavy investment. And uh, because of uh, the poverty that uh, we have in Malawi, uh, the government cannot have enough proceeds on itself to achieve uh, such an ambitious uh, project or program. Mm -hmm. So there is need uh, for our cooperating partners to come in and I start at least transforming uh, in this area. And uh, also there is need for uh, publicity. So at least uh, other partners should be able to appreciate and know uh, what should be done. here. Some of the things can be achieved probably through good civic education where the villagers may participate uh, in uh, achieving some of these things. And uh, also the other interventions, which are maybe the government, the government does provide, for example, we have got uh, what uh, is known as an AIP uh, program. Unfortunately, uh, we have not learned to change and uh, transform ourselves uh, by having a bottom-up approach. It is always one, uh, uh, it, one piece fits all. It is just decided at the top in what, at what we call Capitol Hill. And uh, the whole country is just provided with uh, one intervention. There might be other areas that may not require necessarily the fertilizer, but rather the money can be invested into other longer term uh, projects such as uh, irrigation, building of dams and other things. Yeah. So, if we are to change and transform Malawi, there is need uh, uh, for that. And also on the other hand, there is need for us uh, as Malawi to start uh, utilizing information. We do have information, for example, uh, the pre-cyclone uh, Anna period, there was a lot of uh, uh, information coming in from the mail meteorological services, but then to be also to be frank, nobody uh, among our numbers could expect that uh, whatever information was being provided will, will result into what has yeah. happened because uh, the, the damage of the cyclone is something that we have never seen in our lives. Maybe it's something that may happen in every hundred years. So even planning for that is quite a challenge. But uh, by now we should have also had learned that uh, uh, our people should not be settling in the low lying areas. Yeah. But it's difficult for our people to appreciate, move them out to the higher grounds. That's also another challenge. So we need to civic education. And also the other problem is that even when you move people to what we may call to be the safer areas, the problem is that uh, infrastructure might not be available in those areas. You need to provide schools, you need to provide uh, health services, mm -hmm. you need to provide uh, portable water, you need to provide a uh, road, uh, road infrastructure. Yeah. So people normally settle where such facilities are available. And uh, if you're not able to provide 
uh, as a government or as a country some potable water. At the end of the day, people settle closer to the rivers, closer to where water is in order for them to survive. As you know, we always say that our water is life. Yeah, yeah, obviously it is. Thank you very much, Clement. Amos, are you with us? Um, there is, a, yes, you are with us. Thank you very much. Care has been working in Malawi since 1998. And um, obviously Malawi, one of the most densely populated countries in Africa, a very young population. Um, a young population means a lot of creativity and potential, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, you're very right. Um, a lot of creativity, a lot of potential, uh, especially in the digital yeah. era which we are sitting at the moment. That's mm -hmm. a more reason why chaos programming has been adapted to um, the current needs of our young people, because we believe that the future of the country lies in the hands of those, these young ones. Uh, we have got programs that are exposing the young people, you know, across uh, the different uh, ways of doing business. Uh, we also believe that these young people are quite, you know, upfront, outgoing, and they have got so much to offer. So yeah. we, are, we are designing programs that are, um, are able to nature the talent that, that's in our young people, mm -hmm. giving them lit, uh, limitless opportunities. At the same time, we are also, on the other hand, advocating to government to ensure that there is conducive policy environment that prioritizes investment in young people or options that will give the young people opportunities. In nowadays, we are talking of um, not just going to school to, to, in order to get employed, but we are looking at can we give our young people skill sets that will enable them uh, to have livelihood options that will make sure they're able to feed from themselves, but also they can even create jobs for others. Mm -hmm. uh, last week, we, we, we've submitted um, uh, uh, an innovative concept to the EU where we are looking at the Tibet sector, which in Malawi predominantly it has been looked at as a training ground for plumbers and bricklayers. But mm -hmm. now we are saying we want to move beyond that. We are looking at the, the green livelihoods, for instance, uh, how can we train our young people to go into issues of seed production, seed entrepreneurship? They could look at forest management as a business. How yeah. do we look at the ICT where we can uh, reshape and sharpen their skills further? We want mm -hmm. to see more programmers coming out. We want to mm -hmm. see more designers, architects and staff. That's what we are pitching to our development partners to say, based on our experience right now, we need to do more and invest in our young people. But let's listen from, um, uh, from the young people. The mm -hmm. traditional approach may not take us anywhere because their thinking and, and, and um, the traditional way of doing business quite different. Let's give them the space. But what is important, let us create opportunities. Let us nature the, um, uh, the innovativeness that, that, that we're seeing within our young people. Yeah. So CARE is actually uh, shifting its programming at the moment so that we are focusing more on young people. We are focusing more on, on, on adolescents and, and, and girls to mm -hmm. ensure that they are given the space um, to try out any innovative ideas that they may have. But with the intention of um, broadening up their livelihood um, uh, opportunities, not growing up with the mentality of, let me go to school, let me train on this particular trade in order to get employed. But the mentality should be, I want to make a difference in my mm -hmm. own life in my community and create opportunities that are limitless for my community. That's, that's the, the angle at which we are now pushing our programming, focusing on young people, more especially girls and, uh, and adolescents. So this is very exciting. I mean, in, in, especially in terms of social entrepreneurship, but not, not, not only in, in, in terms of social, uh, being social and an entrepreneur, but you said that there should be more architects, there should be more uh, engineers and, and uh, gardening specialists. I, I mean, so this is exciting. And, and what, what is your experience? How prepared are the young Malawian people uh, to, to, are they receptive? Are they able to be, to follow your, your lead? Or is it still, are you still in a, uh, in a, in a stage where you need the funds to, to be able to roll it out? 
No, no, they are. If you talk to young every day uh, in my work life, I interact with a lot of young people. Yeah. And uh, when I'm in the field, and I can see your smile. <laughs> I can see your smile. Yeah. 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 And when I'm in the field, I spend more time listening mm-hmm. from what young people are looking for. What is what is preventing them? What is stopping them? Yeah. Right? I, I have been to rural areas where you'll find young people are trying to make the best within what is available within their reach. You know, the proliferation of uh, uh, the Android phones in the rural areas. You know, you, you, you'll be amazed to see how much young people are able to generate with that. They're able to do so many things. Uh, we're able to see artists emerging, just using their Android mobile phone to mm-hmm. do things that, you know, an urban young people who, are, who have got access to, you know, modern technology studios and all that are able to do. But these are young people that you would never think about. You know, they're in the middle of nowhere, but because they just have a small Android phone that can have internet, um, you know, you can access, you know, Google and they can have social platforms there. They're able to do so much. So they they are ready. The only issue is that we are not able to create matching uh, opportunities for them. We are not able to give them the pathways that will allow them to maximize and, and achieve their potential that they have. Yeah. And this is the message we are putting across to government. This is the message we are putting across to everyone, all the you know the duty bearers, the policymakers, uh, our development partners. That let us invest more in our young people. Let mm-hmm. us create more opportunities. Where someone is should not be a determining factor whether one will make it in life or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whether yeah. you are in the middle of nowhere in the rural area or you are in the urban area, you should at least get similar opportunities for you to excel as long as you have the determination. So yes, young people in Malawi, they're fired up, they're ready to take everything by storm. The fact is that we are not giving them the right platform for them to do what they can do. Okay, not not yes, but uh, experience you uh, three, I, I bet you you push it in the direction that that will enable them in the near future. Thank you very much, Amos. Uh, Maggie, talking about Android phones and uh, literacy, financial literacy, is this a way for you to empower women and girls? Could are you are you using this? Yes, we are, and um, I think maybe just to highlight that for us. We are not just focusing on women, but we also work with girls. So for girls, what we are doing is to support their education, both in terms of the formal and the informal. So in terms of use of the phone and financial literacy, we have been giving out Androids phone to, phones to some of the girls that we are working with in the rural areas. But suffice to say that, of course, resources are limited, so we cannot afford to give to each and every girl that we work with. But we have seen that uh, those that are able to access those phones, they have been able to access also more information in terms of how they can improve their own lives with regard to issues of economic empowerment, to issue, regard to issues of education. And that's very important for us because for us, we say that uh, we shouldn't be talking about gender inequality in 10 or 20 years time to come when we are not doing anything about, about the girls right now. Yeah. So what we have been doing is to support them as much as possible so that they can get education, both from the formal system, but also the informal system. In terms of financial literacy, apart from just getting from the phones, we have also been doing uh, targeted trainings for the girls. So especially those that are out of school, the out of school youth, those that have not been able to go back to school. So we have been conducting a number of trainings so that they understand um, how issues of business uh, are, are transacted, what kind of businesses they can go into. We have also been supporting them with vocational skills training so that they get some skills which then they can use to survive uh, on their own. So those are some of the things that we have been doing. We have also been linking girls to other countries. So for example, like we have a regional network which is comply- for comprised of girls from Malawi, girls from Zambia, girls from Zimbabwe and Mozambique. So mm-hmm. within that network, they're able to learn from each other. So they're able to get new information in terms of what is happening with some, girl, with some of their friends in other areas. They're able to know what else they can do to improve their lives. So those are some of the things that we have been doing. 
Yeah. And, yeah. and talking about imbalance when it comes to gender, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of that. There's a lot of gender based violence in, in your communities. And how, how, how do you work with, with girls to just, and, and women, obviously, to just, to just um, yeah, be strong yeah. enough to resist and, and protect themselves to be less vulnerable? Mm, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's violence in the community, there's violence in the schools, almost everywhere. But uh, what we have been doing in communities, is that we don't just come and say stop violence. What we have been doing is to empower them with participatory approaches. So one of the approaches that we use is what is called STAR, Society is Tackling AIDS Through Rights. So it has been adopted to address gender-based violence. So what we do is that we create structures of women, of men, of boys and girls. So within the structures, they're able to dial on and see what causes violence within their communities, what are the consequences of violence and then what can they do to address violence so you see that uh, through that kind of dialogue the community comes up with uh, ways and means of how they can address gender-based violence how they can make their communities safer for women mm -hmm. and girls apart from that we have also been working with males as champions we call them men as change agents mm -hmm. so these are men that we train in positive masculinity we train them on how they can address issues of violence within their communities. So they reach out to their fellow men and see what kind of uh, activities they can do to address gender-based violence. We have also been working with traditional leaders because these are gatekeepers. So if traditional leaders are not able to get the right information in terms of gender, in terms of human rights, women's rights, most of the times they also perpetuate <clears throat> gender-based violence. So we have been working with traditional leaders on how they can address gender-based violence within their communities. So you find that there are some that have actually come up with bylaws. So not just depending on the national laws, but also coming up with community bylaws on what they are going to do when violence takes place within their communities. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that we have been doing with communities. Yeah. Our, yeah. Yeah. So you're working with different strategic allies to, to really bring across your message and, and help to empower women and especially girls in the community. Yes, of course, uh, this work, you cannot just do it on your own. Mm -hmm. So like at community level, you find that there are also structures that have been put by government. Yeah. Uh, structures like community policy, structures like victim support units, structures like community development uh, offices, uh, social welfare. So all these structures together, we work together so that uh, we address the same. At national level, the same. We yeah. are working with other NGOs, we're working with government, Minister of Gender itself, we're working with other partners to address gender-based violence at that level. Mm -hmm. So I would say that uh, what we have also learned is that you cannot just do the work on your own. You need to link up with so many other stakeholders. Yeah, and obviously you are aiming for a sustainable change. And so you really need to, to, to have a close-knit approach and, and really make sure that, that your vision comes through. This exactly. is really exciting. Fantastic. Um, Clement, I would like to take um, a question on, of the audience. Uh, there was someone who asked, wondered, um, uh, he referenced or she referenced the 1974 World Food Conference Declaration, in which uh, it was said that by the year 2000, no child should go to bed with empty belly. And he or she is asking, why, 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 why is it? Why, why did we fail so miserably? And there are still... They are still in 2022, poverty, child poverty is, is an issue. Why is that, Clement, in your view? Mike is not on, please. We, we cannot hear you. A number of factors mm -hmm. that have contributed uh, to such a problem and, uh, that, and why we are continuing having such challenges. To start with, in 1974, when that was being declared, we were still having problems here in Malawi in terms of hunger. However, at that time, our population was around 5 million. Hmm. Now it's almost today, 20 million. Today, our population is about 20 million. Hmm. And uh, our land mass is still the same. Our way of... Uh, cultivating the fields is still the same. We're still using uh, uh, the primitive hand hole. Thirdly, we are still depending on land fed agriculture. So in terms of uh, production, we have not increased. This is why I had uh, 
appealed that uh, there is need for us to adopt better ways of farming and also implement irrigation agriculture. Because the same land that we're using in 1974, when we're having challenges of, of hunger, is the same land mass that we're using today and planting once a year. People work three, three months in a year and they expect to be fed 12 months in a year. Hmm. So it is quite a big challenge. So much as uh, the resolution was passed in 1974, there haven't been uh, enough interventions on the, on the ground to, to, to fulfill the desired goal. If at that time, uh, interventions were put on the ground, people had adopted it, and uh, they had also looked at uh, an element of uh, population control in one way or the other, uh, things would have been different. Population, population is increasing in Africa at, a much, at a, much, a much faster pace than in other continents. Our population is a young population. Most of the people, over half our population is below the age of 35, mm -hmm. which means the increase in population is uh, surpassing and uh, overcoming all the gains that may have been uh, uh, achieved over the time in terms of uh, maybe educating the people and uh, also uh, changing our eating habits by uh, appreciating other, other foods as being food because uh, predominantly in Africa and Malawi in particular, we just look at maize as food. But today, things are changing. People are adopting and adapting other types of food and appreciate that, yes, we have eaten having eaten other types of food, but that is not enough yeah. because all the gains are being eroded by the, by the growth of population. Yeah, okay. And I'm sure my mm -hmm. colleagues can also add on that because they're also in the field and uh, they do appreciate the challenges that we're facing yeah. in, uh, in, the, in, in the rural areas. Yeah, thank you very much, Clement. Yeah, yeah, uh, talking about Amos and Maggie, I mean, um, how stable is, is your country, Malawi? I mean, you have uh, a President Lazarus Chagwera since two, 2020. Is he supporting your, your goals, your, your vision for, for a better future when it comes to Malawi, um, uh, malnourishment, education, health, uh, health uh, topics, um, disaster relief? How, how do you feel? Do you get support from, from politics? Maggie or Amos, who okay. would like to answer? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, can, I can go, I can come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so anyway, I think I would say that uh, when the new government came into place, we had very high expectations. I think uh, because they had already outlined what they thought were the challenges for the country. Yeah. And then they had that outlined in terms of how they thought they were going to address the challenges. Unfortunately, uh, now we are almost like two years after they were voted into power. We don't see what they said they were going to do. I think what we see mostly is lip service as opposed to action. Mm -hmm. So um, it's very difficult to say there's a lot of political will right now in, within the government. We have very good uh, laws. Like, for example, when you talk about gender, we have very good progressive laws that are trying to, gen to um, address issues of women empowerment, uh, gender equality. But for me, I think what remains is the implementation of the policies of the laws so that they become meaningful to people's lives. So we are yet to see a government that is going to uh, lead by acting on what they promised that they were going to do. But right now, we still have challenges in the education sector. We still have challenges in the health sector. We still have challenges in the agriculture sector, which are not being addressed compared to what they had promised. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is sad. And um, for example, like the gender, the gender agenda, we had to protest as women. We had to go on the street to protest so that they could start uh, using the gender equality law. So yeah. for us, they're saying that it seems that we need to voice out for them to act. And yet 
the social contract that we signed with them at the time that people are voting for them was they are going to do the right thing. They are going to go by the rule of law so that things work out for the Malayan citizens. Mm -hmm. yeah. You were leading the women's manifesto movement, right? And this is this yes, is yes. your platform where, where you're voicing your, your concerns, exactly. and your, your, yes. your, your demands. Yeah, that's the, that's the movement, yes. Yeah, yeah, lovely, lovely, fantastic okay. to hear. Yeah. Uh, Amos, uh, what is your take on the current situation and your hope for the future? I mean, we're in the last uh, eight minutes of our discussion. Uh, let us shift and, and, and try to focus on, on visions, on future. What, what is what is in your package? What is on your, your desk? What, what are you uh, heading to, towards in the next uh, yeah, years, months, if you want a shorter perspective? Your, your mic is from where, from where I'm seated, I'm, yeah. I'm looking at um, endless opportunities for, yeah. for Malawi. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at um, Malawians that are uh, ready to exploit opportunities that comes their way. Why am I saying this? Just building on what Clement said, that 1974, we're dealing with a population of 5 million and below. 99% uh, of that population uh, was not educated or uh, they had very less or very little education. Today in 2022, we, uh, we have a population close to 20 million and we have majority of that population that has at least you know, attained better education. And, and that could allow us to inform better into our future strategies and how we want to move on as a people. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I see at the moment. And, and um, organizations like CARE and all other agencies and different initiatives that are there, they're trying to push towards that direction. How can we take the country to the next level? The only missing piece is getting the right leadership, is getting the politicians to walk the talk, is yeah. to get the politicians to help us to put resources in the right manner. Yeah. We have seen in the modern days what has happened in Rwanda. We saw the direction that Tanzania took uh, some five years ago, whether they will maintain on that course, that's different. But we could see transformation happening within a short space of time. So it is possible. But then it depends on what sort of leadership political are we going to have in the next five, 10, 15 years. If we get the leadership that's really, um, you know, focusing on these issues, leadership that is strategic, leadership that is serious about delivering services to the people, harnessing the opportunities that I'm talking about. Yeah. We have the resources as a country. All we need is to pull our resources together. Like Maggie has said, the current administration, when they were campaigning, they gave us, you know, lots of hopes. Last Sunday, which was yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, the Catholic Church released the pastorator where they, they are trying to unpack all these promises and say, look, two years down the line, it's not what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. So the more we continue to have leadership that abandons the promises and focus on other issues, that will shatter all the hopes that we have. Mm -hmm. I always say this in whatever forums that I see, even directly face to face with government and, and, and the politicians, very clear, no country will develop if you put your efforts and left ev and leave everything in the hands of non-state actors to drive the agenda forward. It will not happen. It will not come through. Mm -hmm. Because the initiative that non-state actors will bring on the table, they, sh they are complementary. So you cannot take complementary initiatives and put them at the front. While you as government, who are supposed to drive the main agenda, are busy pushing a different agenda altogether. So yes, we see a better Malawi. We see a better you know, country for our young ones. And uh, the future is bright. But the only condition is that if we can get the leadership well configured to drive the processes and drive the issues forward, we are going to have a Malawi that we are all dreaming about. It okay. is possible and we are all geared to support uh, the construction and the putting together of such a Malawi. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you, Amos. That's fantastic. Clement, a very short statement on your side, please. Uh, just, just a minute. How, if you could summarize your wish list and when it comes to how to boost uh, and, and bring Malawi to the next level, what, what, what is there as, as the main, main point? Amos has said it all. Okay. That, that uh, the challenges uh, are with the people fine, but are much more with the leadership. The leadership has to lead the way. They have to come up with policies that are pro-growth. At the same time, we also need to educate our people, civic education, and ensure that at least we move a step up. Uh, as we are speaking now, there is not much hope from the people. People mm. have lost hope because of the way things are being done, because people were expecting that uh, things will be done differently, but uh, not much is being seen, yeah. uh, pointing towards a direction of doing things differently. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of uh, coming up with a policy and uh, walk the talk. Yeah, thank you very much, Clement. Maggie, uh, uh, you will get the last, the last, uh, the last part in this uh, discussion. Uh, talking about leadership and female leadership, I mean, um, um, there is even a lack of female presidential candidates in the 2019 campaign, right? I, I saw that yeah. someone, a, a lady with with your name, even even uh, promised to to run and then withdraw. Uh, her, her campaigning idea. So uh, where, where will they come, the inspiration for, for girls to just uh, move up the ladder and, and become politically involved, perhaps, in the future yeah. for Navi? Okay. Um, of course, we have had a female president before, mm -hmm. but it's just unfortunate that the circumstances under which she, came, she became president were not as good. So she became president because we had lost a president. But still, to say that at the time, that she became president, I think it, it made us uh, uh, realize as a nation that we can still have a female president. And I think at that time, people had a lot of support for her. Unfortunately, when it came now to uh, the other elections, she lost. Mm -hmm. But uh, for us, we haven't lost hope because right now what is now happening, you find that uh, more and more women are rising up in different positions in the public. You are system. one, hello. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I mean the angel sector, but also in the public sector, you find that more and more women are rising up. So those are now acting as role models. Mm -hmm. And I think even our society is now coming to realize to say, it's not really that a woman will not make a good president because we have also seen men failing as presidents. So if we can have a woman that is capable enough to stand up, I am sure that people are going to support that. Though we still have patriarchal views and patriarchal attitudes in some cases. Um, but for me, I would also say that um, we are also trying to um, motivate young women to join politics. So we have interventions to that end, interventions supported by EU, interventions supported by the Danish government, trying to see if young women, both those that are in school and out of school, they can actually feel to say they can join politics as something which they can do as part of their career, but also to assist the nation to move forward. So I'm sure that with all those interventions, in one or another, we're going to find such kind of uh, females that are able to now rise up and contest in elections. And I would say that I think, I think at this point, people are just looking for better leadership. So if that leadership comes from a woman, people will be able to vote for that. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. Thank you very much, Maggie. Thank you very much, Clement. Thank you very much, Almos. I, th I think we try to 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 have an idea and, and, and of, of where all you where where you're moving in this this exciting challenge to really rise up and 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 allow Malawi to just uh, to, to just find a, a way out of this this crisis situation. We do hope sincerely and from the bottom of our hearts that that Malawi is on a good track and that you will receive the funds, the donations uh, you 
urgently need to just uh, progress and just just uh, foster your, your agenda. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much in the audience and giving us the question you gave us. That was very, uh, that was great. If you feel that you're interested in this uh, whole uh, series of the 10 most underreported humanitarian crises, please meet us again, uh, March 21. This is exactly two weeks from now. We're going to feature the Central African Republic and are going to highlight with uh, a panel uh, exactly like we did today uh, with our wonderful panel from Malawi. Thank you very much for, for being with us. Thank you very much in the audience and to please stay healthy and let's keep on the fight. Thank you very much and talk to you. Thank you, Britta. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Britta. Thank you, Anas. Thank you. Bye-bye.